was a midweek update, but I guess we, were, we just left the air in St. Louis at, at 11.30. Uh, we are here in Jefferson City with the State Director of Health, Randall Waves. Thank you for making the time on what has to be a very busy, hectic time for you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Uh, we had so many questions. I want to thank everybody. We had like 200 people uh, sending in questions. We kind of narrowed them down, and a lot of them were duplicates, but a lot of stuff I never even thought about. But first, just off the top, I, I think that it seemed to me Wednesday evening, mm -hmm. this emergency really hit home to everyone right uh and with the the senate uh, state senate was one of the first groups of bodies in the nation to cancel followed by the nba and the sec and major league baseball um the state's response i know you've uh, this is something that's been on your mind for quite some time now what has the state's response been kind of timeline thus far i saw the, the state of emergency yeah. what does that mean yeah i think that well the state of emergency is just part of our kind of involving in, in any of these emerging diseases, Scott, these new diseases. Uh, we, we built off of our 2018 uh, pandemic plan for the flu, but this isn't the flu, but it very mm -hmm. much uh, is very similar to that. And so uh, as we uh, evolve into that, we use other resources. So the state of emergency allows us to have other resources to kind of broaden our scope. But to your, you know, to your point, uh, the first patient in the United States was uh, diagnosed on January 21st. I was on a conference call on January 26th with all the state health directors with my good friend John Weisman in Washington State where that first patient presented. And then on January 27th, we stood up our incident management team, and we've been meeting every day since January 27th. Uh, so uh, incredibly well prepared, but you'll see us as we move forward we will constantly evolve to situations on the ground. We now have five cases. Uh, and so uh, to date, uh, most of those have been travel acquired. We may now have a, a situation down in Henry County mm -hmm. that's not travel acquired. So we're very much looking at that today. Uh, when the governor declares a state of emergency, what's the difference between that and how this was being treated the day before? Yeah, it's a great question. So in Missouri, different states have different things. Kansas, you can declare a public health emergency. And statutorily, we don't have that uh, in Missouri. But about a year ago, because of Legionella, we looked very closely at our ability to handle an infectious disease as far as quarantining and isolating and giving advisories. And so we um, uh, modified that to make it much more robust. So in Missouri, the, those powers let, uh, rest within the department to isolate, quarantine, cancel, those types. So as uh, as people move forward, you know, you're, you, I think I think people are watching the news. I've watched ESPN more than I, I did before. I did just because it was interesting to me how the, the leagues were canceling. But what are what is a time frame that you think that people can look to say well, if we make it through April yeah. normal life, or is there even yeah. a way to forecast that yet? Yeah, well, I think what we're hoping for is that you're, you're going to see clusters and surges throughout the United States in different locations. Mm -hmm. We think you'll see that. We hope we don't have widespread throughout the United States. We think uh, Tony Fauci, uh, who uh, is head of uh, infectious disease and allergies for the uh, United States, who I know and respect greatly, is hopeful that in those areas like Washington State that have had surges in the community, that by late April, that those will start to burn out. Of course, you know, here in Missouri, uh, we're not there yet. We yeah. haven't seen that kind of surge yet. So if you ask me, I would think that uh, here in Missouri, probably April, um, May, uh, we could see some isolated areas. And then we always hope, uh, if we can get to summer, sure, that uh, for everything but H1N1, that usually helps us. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, H1N1, it didn't. But uh, from what we know about COVID-19 as it relates to SARS and MERS, we're hopeful if we can get to summer, it'll get better. Is that what folks should call it? I mean, I think people call it coronavirus, but is that the actual name that you call yeah, it? Yeah, we call it COVID-19 because, you know, coronaviruses are the common cold. So, okay. So, you know, every time you have a cold, you have a coronavirus. So I think you assume I knew that. I did not know no, that. That's yeah. interesting. So they, they made it COVID-19 to distinguish it just from the common cold. Well, uh, let's get into some of the questions from our readers. Uh, Robert and Carl Johnson ask, what can people do to can, to help to help? I mean, yeah. I think it's emergency. What, what can a regular Missourian do to try to help? everyone and contain this from becoming a surge in Missouri. Yeah, Robert, that's that. Tell Robert, that is the question. Here's what we think. We think as we look at all the social distancing and mitigating strategies, the number one thing that I think will minimize this is 
if we can identify those people as soon as they become symptomatic and then uh, isolate them, test them, and keep them from spreading. Now, the distinguishing thing about COVID-19 is it gives you a fever. And that's unlike everything else. It's unlike the common cold. Mm -hmm. And so 99%, 95% of people have a fever. Now, when we do our case contacts, usually those people have up to 36 people they've been exposed to. Uh, when we go in and identify somebody and try to see who they might have infected. So where we're really basing our strategy in Missouri is if we can identify those people as early as possible and isolate them, we think that kind of personal responsibility, that personal mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, acknowledgement to get tested is what will uh, significantly decrease the morbidity and mortality of this. You mentioned the person in Henry County. Um, mm -hmm. He said you don't know if it was travel related. Right. When will you know? Uh, we are. Uh, we were there yesterday. We we're there today doing all our contacts, trying to find that out. Uh, and so what we do is we've done this in Springfield. We did this in St. Louis, and now we're doing Henry County. Uh, when we have somebody who's identified, we go in and and try to find out first of all who might uh, they might have uh, affected. And so uh, we then either test them. We only test symptomatic people. Uh, because the test will come back negative mm -hmm. if you're asymptomatic usually. And so we identify those people and uh, so and, and see if there's any travel. But to date, uh, as of yesterday, we can see no uh, travel history in him. But the folks down in Clinton County, they're admitting patients to get to the hospital. Is that right? Mm -hmm. They're back operational? No. Um, as of today, we're waiting for the more testing. They're still on diversion as of mm -hmm. today. Uh, and so we're, they, they identified some people that they want us to test, and uh, we're doing that today, and we'll have those results tomorrow. Carolyn Jackson, this is the question that was said by, I don't know, three dozen people. We were talking about doing this yesterday, but events didn't let us, uh, in order to lead the state and flatten the curve, should people go to church? Great question. You see governors uh, all around, mm -hmm. mayors, you know, limiting, saying no crowd bigger than 1,000, no crowd bigger than 250, no crowd bigger than 500. You mm -hmm. see that? So we, we clearly think social distancing uh, has an effect. Uh, where that number lies is, is hard to say based on science. Uh, I think our message is very much this. Uh, the average age for mortality in Italy for this disease is 81. It's 80% 80 men, 20% women. And one reason Italy's had such a tough time is it's just an older country. People sure. live there longer. And so what I would say is this is a time in which you, if you are older, or you have any kind of chronic health conditions, uh, then I probably would really limit my um, attendance to any type of mass event. Now, if you're young uh, and, and healthy, uh, that would probably be a different situation. Let me jump down. Uh, there was a question from Chris in Popper Bluff. Uh, he talked about uh, social distancing. He was talking, it was more of a conversation, was the point I made a note of. Uh, when you're talking about social distancing, what does that actually mean to a person? I've never heard that term until yeah. recently. Yeah, it can mean two things. One is just, you know, we think the, the radius of spreading the disease is about six feet. So in your workspace and that kind of thing, if you can kind of keep that. Uh, and so, and then the other social distancing is, as we talked about, not attending um, large events, uh, uh, and so it's really both individual and then group social distancing. Uh, in the state of emergency, this is from Trish here in Jeff City. The governor uh, mentioned he was unleashing seven million in state funding. What what should that money go to? Yeah, I think that certainly uh, one of our big concerns is our first responders, uh, and so when you look at law enforcement and fire and EMS, we just want to make sure they're protected. And and his declaring that state of emergency is going to enable us to get out a lot of personal protective equipment, uh, gloves, gowns, masks. And so we really appreciate him doing that because uh, I was uh, reading this morning in Italy, I think it is, um, they've had a huge number of healthcare providers get sick. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, you know, as you can imagine, uh, that's even uh, a double uh, a problem when the people who are, you're counting on to take care of you in a public health crisis can't do it. So it's just really important to us that those first responders and providers uh, be kept safe. Uh, Barry down in Parma talked about, uh, he wanted, he had a statement that ended with a question about the president's earlier statements about referring to this as a hoax. I guess my question would be, there's been a very different response from the governor as the president. 
Um, what would you say to people that may have heard that and, and early on when he said that took away that, I mean, I, I assume your statement is this is not a hoax. No, and I, I think, you know, I, I'm good friends with, you know, Bob Redfield and, and uh, the people, Jerome Adams, all, all the people uh, in the White House and in that area. And I think that uh, it, it's always been taken incredibly seriously. But on the other hand, this is unprecedented. Uh, we've never seen yeah. this in my lifetime. I, I lived through H1N1 in mm -hmm. 2009. That was a pandemic. But, Scott, to me, the big difference here is for the first time ever in my lifetime, and I've been doing this a long time, is we're isolating and quarantining people. You know, think about it. Before, if you had a really bad flu season like we had here in Missouri two years ago, you could have a fever of 105, feel terrible, but you go to work the next day if you felt fine, and yeah. nobody would ever know. Well, now, not only when we identify people, are we making them go home, but if you've had contact with them and you feel perfectly healthy, we are isolating you for 14 days. Yeah. That's never happened. And I think that's why you're seeing so much disruption here. Let me ask a question on this. While the president may have said what he said at a press conference, what, in your opinion, has been the response from the federal government? Has the actual people on the ground and, and the people that you just yeah. referenced, what has their response been? I think it's been, you know, uh, good. I think the one thing that everybody regrets is the uh, glitches in getting the testing out. I know Bob yeah. Redfield, uh, you know, I think that they've been disappointed in that, that they tried to get out the test twice to the state labs and they couldn't do it. And that was all over the specificity uh, uh, over the coronavirus because the problem with the test was it was testing for the other coronaviruses, the cold sure. and that kind of thing. And they needed one that was just specific for COVID-19. So if you ask me what has been the one uh, handicap we've had in this, it is is the rollout of uh, kind of universal testing. So right now, if you have a fever, the symptoms are fever, cough, and respiratory issues? Yes. It, it's Scott, it, the thing about it is it's lower. You know, it's mm -hmm. not upper respiratory. It's not, it's not a runny nose. It's not... Uh, cold-like symptoms. It literally is a fever. That's the number one thing. And then a uh, cough, dry, hacking cough, not productive. In, in your lungs hurt. It, that's the thing about COVID-19. Well, so if, you had a, if you had a cough that was low, it would produce something, right? Because you'd yeah. be it'd loosen things up. But this is non-productive. Yeah. These coughs are dry and hacking. And so, uh, it, it, but the, like I said, the mainstay is the fever. You know, if you have a cough and a fever, we need to know. If somebody it. watching this has those symptoms in the state of Missouri, yep. can they get tested? Or yes. are those tests available now? Absolutely. So what we want to do is call your provider. Just don't show up. Just say, look, sure. I've, I've got a fever. Uh, I've got a cough. And so they're going to route you to where they think. So my brother-in-law mentioned he is a general practice yeah. physician down the boot hill. And he said this could be a whole innovative thing in people and using telemedicine. Yeah, absolutely. Because it doesn't help you to come in and expose everybody yeah, else. Absolutely. And so what's going to happen then is we have fairly strict criteria for who we test. We can do 100 tests a day. Uh, and so uh, we're saving our tests to the, so that we don't have a situation where somebody's critically ill and we can't do a test. Yeah, exactly. We're doing you know, 40 a day, 50 a day. But starting on Tuesday, Wash U will be doing 50 tests a day, quickly ramp up. There's a private lab in uh, uh, Lee Summit that's doing 1,000 a day right now. University of Missouri, we hope we can get them online. And then Quest and LabCorp uh, here in Missouri, uh, we've been talking to Quest yesterday that uh, are, are now making it commercially available. You know, we're incredibly blessed here in Missouri. Bill Whitmore is president of the American Public Health Laboratory Association. So, excuse me. Uh, so, um, so um, we um, literally had proximity to the president of Quest and, and the president of LabCorp. So, I believe that in two weeks' time, that uh, ev that we will expand greatly the the number of people who who qualify to be tested. But remember, you have to be symptomatic. You know, sometimes it's uh, our public institutions. It's easy to. Not Mizzou or things until something like this. Right. That's one of the places you go to. to exactly. To, uh, this is from Annette Chesterfield. Uh, she asks, is washing your hands more important than hand sanitizer? And she even brought up, is there a risk using too much hand sanitizer? It could lead to um, a bigger problem later. Yeah. Uh, the answer is no. Either one is acceptable, whichever is going. Uh, and the only problem with using it too much, obviously, is you can get kind of dry skin. You know, mm -hmm. but, but that's not a long-term problem. But no. We just really encourage people to use either hand sanitizer or washing their hands, hot or cold water. doesn't matter. You can air dry or towel dry. It was Rachel's question in Raytown. There are people that said they've been denied a test. 
Is that just because they didn't meet the, the qualifications? Yeah, uh, and so let's just say uh, you're a perfectly healthy person. You haven't traveled anywhere. You have a cough and a fever, but you, you have no known exposure. You haven't been exposed to somebody who know, we know have the disease, that you haven't traveled anywhere where the disease is, King County, um, Washington, or something like that, then you wouldn't meet the criteria. Now, I think in two weeks we'll expand that criteria so that if you just have a cough and a fever, we will test you. And, and remember, Scott, with the commercial test, uh, there are no criteria. So if you if, walk up and buy it, right? Yeah. You walk well, up, what do you think that's going to cost? Uh, it's uh, about $198. I think for a lot of people, that peace of mind might be worth a couple hundred dollars. Well, I mean, you know, the president said yesterday that, that all the testing is going to be free. So I don't know how they're, gonna, they're going to um, institute that, but I did hear them say that. Uh, what uh, This is from Tom in Columbia. What does a COVID-19 test entail? What do they do when you get tested? Yeah, it's a PCR, a polymerase chain reaction. It takes us about six hours to do. Is it a mouth swab or yeah, blood? Or that? Yeah, we, we, we do an oral swab, an oral pharyngeal swab, and a nasal swab. It's two swabs. Uh, and then um, we batch them together and, and send them off. Uh, this one uh, comes from Ken in St. Louis. When you're quarantined, what is that like? Do you go to your home? Do you go to a yeah. hospital? Yeah, if you're sick, we put you in a hospital. If you're not sick, you just go home. And it's just to avoid contact with people. So you're free to do whatever you can, but we just don't want you to have contact with people during that time. There was another question I had, but it was, I think it was from Charlotte, also in St. Louis, and she asked, can you use DoorDash if you're quarantined? Can you have like schnooks that I will deliver? Do you yeah. Can you do those things, or do you, do you tell people, I've yeah. died in quarantine? Yeah. Or? yeah, you do, and they would just leave the things outside. Is it like Home Alone, you leave the you leave the money outside, <laughs> and the, the pizza guy drops it over the front door? It would be something like that. Yeah, that's, uh, so you can get groceries and yeah. things. and yeah. uh, that. I, so I thought the toilet paper thing was a hoax. Right. Yesterday, I stopped into Walgreens, because right. I, I like Walgreens, a small parking lot. And I and I look and there's a whole empty rack. Yeah. And I I'm like that's I don't know Saturday. But, yeah. But it was toilet paper. Yeah. Is, is that rational or what's the? Um, and uh, personally, I don't think that's rational. Yeah. No. Uh, but we you know, we see it every time there's a big snow. I mean. Yeah. Well, I guess it's one of those things you're going to use it, right? Right. And it's you know it's probably not going to go bad. So, but. Yeah. I'm but, surprised. Yeah, but you know, um, we know that uh, when people are afraid, uh, they have a real tendency they want to do something. They, they want to act, and so uh, I think that's a way that they feel like they're doing something. Uh, that's pretty common human emotion. This comes from Jim in here in Jeff City. He said there people have been tweeting photos of empty uh, grocery store aisles. I saw those. I actually saw one at the Lee Summit Walgreens. That yesterday, I, I'm still surprised. Uh, maybe the syrup boys came in and he cleaned it out. I don't know. But is there any uh, is there any product you would recommend stocking up on, it's like medication, Sucafed, Mucinex, or whatever? Is there something you would recommend grabbing? No, not really. I mean, I, you know, they go through the basics. You just make sure you have you know, your um, supply of medicines. Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, uh, from the from the pharmacy, but other than that, I I, I don't think we're going to get to that sort of kind of uh, national global. Uh, 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 shortages. I just, I just don't think we're going to get to that. It's from Heath and Farmington. Uh, what guidance are you giving other departments like corrections or mental health to try to mitigate bigger problems? Great question. So uh, I have personally reviewed uh, when, when the governor became governor, being a sheriff, first thing he did was make us present to him our continuity of operation plans. And so we are you know, very concerned about long-term care facilities, prisons, veterans' homes, yeah. behavioral health. And so we've reviewed all those. I've reviewed all of them personally with each department. It's interesting. If you look at corrections, for instance, they have. I was so impressed with Ann and Matt, what they've done. Just to give you an example, the average prison guard, I think it's like 35, mm -hmm. and the average inmate's like 40. So right off the bat, you go, okay, these aren't 70-year-olds. So that makes you feel somewhat better. Uh, and then um, uh, when you look at the veterans' home, obviously you get very concerned. I met with all the long-term care facility people on Friday. So based on this lag time, when we've had a chance to learn about the disease, Scott, uh, we are very, very much focused on our nursing homes, our veterans' homes, and our behavioral health centers where people do tend to be older. And again, that's where all the mortality is. I mean, it's two out, you know, flu, one out of a thousand people die. With COVID-19, two out of a hundred die. And they're almost all over 60. It's interesting. Uh, you know, Precise, one of the you know, more noted directors yeah. of correction in the whole country, 
what would be a plan if you do have a positive yeah. at, a, at a prison? Yeah. So uh, we've been over. We spent three hours going over with her. Yeah. First thing, you know, first thing is you've got to take care of the patient, and you've got to make sure that nobody else gets infected. And they've got a great plan to do that. The moment they know, they isolate. They can do their own epidemiological investigation, which is pretty impressive. That they can go in immediately and say, "Okay, who is this prisoner exposed to? Let's isolate them." Uh, and and uh, if it becomes symptomatic, we'll test them. And then the second thing you have to be concerned about is, is the guards. You know, sure. so you've got to then uh, very much focus on, on the employees and see how many of them were exposed. And many of them will have to be going 14 days of, of uh, quarantine uh, because they were exposed. So you're going to have to have systems in place to replace part of your workforce. Okay. So they've done a great job. Let's, uh, the last question I had is about schools, the Jubilee yeah. and Ballins. I personally know other states have canceled school for two weeks or so. Yeah. A lot of, like my daughter, is on spring yeah. break this coming week. Uh, what, why is this, why is my Governor Parson yeah. not canceled schools like other governors have? I think 19 governors have canceled school. Uh, the thing about COVID-19 is it really doesn't affect children. Um, and so normally with flu, that's the first thing you think of is, you know, we're going to cancel school. Mm -hmm. Influenza A, influenza B, H1N1, which has really, really affected school children. With COVID-19, you don't see that. So I think you have to be more situational and thoughtful about that. Not that you wouldn't have that happen maybe in certain areas, but to say that you're going to shut down all the schools in a, in a disease that doesn't predominantly affect children, I think you'd have to be more thoughtful about. What What is the logic in these other states? Are they more worried about the teachers? Are they more worried about... Well, that's a great point. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, you can certainly see that with teachers, but um, I think uh, that... In this case, I don't think you want to shoot from the hip. I think you want to be very specific when you do that because, as you know, there's there's a downside to doing that in that if those kids go home and stay the show, they tend to congregate elsewhere. Sure. And if their parents are working, they may go stay with their grandparents. It was funny. My daughter was out of school Friday, mm -hmm. and Friday night she was over staying the night with one of her, her friends. Right, and, right. And she didn't go Friday because she was yeah. worried about this. Uh, what is that move as this situation unfolds? What are some things, like if you're a parent, can the local schools cancel school on their own, I assume? Absolutely. And so, um, again, uh, the governor's you know, been very clear. He just thinks, being a former sheriff, that to the degree possible, these decisions really should be made at the local level. Mm -hmm. they, they have a much better understanding of their communities, uh, of the school board, and all that. I saw Kip Kendrick is introducing some legislation from Columbia. That would, if you cancel the school because of this, you don't lose the funding. Right. That, it, it matters to schools. I mean, sure. people make light of it during the Capitol, but that's, they have a budget to meet and to, yeah. to, in order to educate kids. He was going to keep them whole if they chose to do that. Uh, what are some things that need to happen for the governor and yourself to look at maybe canceling schools statewide from top well, down? I, again, uh, with these emerging diseases, we're always practicing situational awareness. I think that if you get into that, that, that extreme degree of social distancing, Mm -hmm. then, you know, that's what you do. But I think, again, here in Missouri, we have the, the uh, ability to see what's going on around the country and, and kind of develop our capacity to deal with that. So I think what you'll see is, uh, at least for the time being, that uh, you'll see actions maybe in Kansas City or St. Louis and, and see how things evolve. Uh, the last question I had was back to, you mentioned Henry County case. Mm -hmm. You mentioned he might be... Uh, might not have got it from traveling. If right. this person didn't get it from that, what does that mean? Well, that means community spread, spread, and that would be the first case in Missouri where you got it from somebody else in the community. But you've seen that in other parts of the country? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, in Washington uh, State, that's clearly been going on. And, and so um, once you once you get into community transmission where people are giving it to each other, mm -hmm. then... Uh, that's when the surge happens. And... Exactly. So uh, we'll appreciate you making the time. Last question. I. My son does nuts because he likes them. Right. I've always been a handshake guy. Right now, if you see somebody on the street, and we're Midwesterners, we want to be friendly. Right. How do, you do, do you do the elbow thing? or We'll do the elbow. I'll do the elbow thing. There you go. Director, thank you so much for making the time. Scott, Let's watch Missouri Times for the updates. Uh, come out of state government, and we'll be back uh, normally Wednesday at 11, and then Sunday of this week in Missouri politics.